at the outset, I'd like to thank the chairperson for the invitation, and I have no financial disclosure significant to this presentation. Glaucoma is quite common among patients with uveitis, as, uh, as has been mentioned by speakers earlier today, and it can range from open angle, classically with steroid-induced, or with trabeculitis, or with pupillary block or neovascular glaucoma. The mechanical blockage that occurs in the angle because of trabeculitis or inflammation is very often the cause, especially in early acute inflammation. Angle closure is, of course, a sequelae of long-term inflammation because of synical um, uh, additions between the iris and the lens, and rarely because of choroidal effusions causing, causing forward rotation of the ciliary body causing a secondary angle closure. So gonioscopy is a must in any eye that you are planning to take up for glaucoma surgery because very often you will see these type of very large sinicae there which if these are the sort of sinicae that you are seeing in the superior angle it's practically impossible to do a trabeculectomy in these eyes since you have no access to the peripheral iris. Neovascularization of the iris is the other possible reason for angle closure and this needs to be addressed too because you would need to take care of the neovascularization before you do anything about the glaucoma. Direct inflammation of the trabecular meshwork with postnatrosmen or keratouveitis is another rare cause of glaucoma, and there you might see these classic keratic precipitates in the angle. Again, once inflammation is controlled, these eyes usually do pretty well. I will spend a little bit of time on steroid-induced glaucoma because that is one of the commonest causes of glaucoma. And before we go to steroid-induced glaucoma in uveitis, we must know that approximately 50% of normal people are, are at significant risk of a steroid response with medications. And in uveitic patients who are on steroids for long lengths of time, this sort of occurs pretty commonly. And the risk factors include childhood and late adulthood, connective tissue disorders, most of which are quite common in patients with uveitis. It is common in children and it's probably just unrecognized because very often we don't check an intraocular pressure. Among those children on four times a day steroid, you see a steroid response in as many as 71% of children. So your children with uveitis also need to be monitored for a steroid response. And you get steroid response with all types of presentations and with increasing concentrations of the drug, you still get a steroid response. Even with the so-called non-IOP racing steroids like FML, you would still see an IOP elevation of almost 8.4 millimeters of mercury in those who are susceptible to a steroid response. As the concentration of the drug goes up, so does your intraocular pressure uh, response to the drug. Typically, you can expect to see a steroid response anywhere between two to six weeks. Systemic steroids usually take much longer to, re uh, to result in an IOP spike, and intravitreal trimsulinone typically takes eight to 14 weeks, but we have seen patients where even a single dose of topical steroids has pushed the pressure up. All concentrations, all drugs can cause the IOP to go up, all types of steroids, but don't forget DEXA is the is the number one in that list in terms of its potential for causing IOP elevations. IVTA has been dealt with in the past and I am just going to deal with just one thing over here and that is this. If you look at the intraocular pressure response amongst the responders, you see it quite early and it lasts for as much as six months to nine months after the IVTA. So an IVTA, post-IVTA steroid response is not something that goes away very early and it hangs in there for a long time and these are eyes which sometimes land up requiring surgical intervention. And you can see that, you know, you have this, the peak rise that you see is around this point. Within one to three months is when most patients show arise. And after that, those who have got an elevated IOP continue to have an elevated IOP, but those who have, I'm talking about a greater than 10 millimeter increase in IOP, even other patients who don't have such a dramatic increase still show more than 30% increase in IOP from their baseline with time. Of course, there's also a higher risk of this response in post vitrectomy or pseudophagic eyes. Now, regarding the resolution of the response, usually can occur within days, especially if it's an initial insult. Typically, within four weeks of stopping steroids, most patients would have dropped pressures to their near normal levels if everything else is okay. Rarely, some of them convert to an open angle glaucoma and continue to have elevated response. So how do you manage it? You stop steroids. Well, unfortunately, if you stop steroids, most of your UVA colleagues stop talking to you, and I'm probably not going to be allowed back home. So you need to continue to use these steroids, and you need to see whether you can reduce the frequency or taper them a little more rapidly than otherwise. 
ALT is not a not an option in this eye, so you are left with only medical or surgical treatment. And even in medical treatment, you cannot use myotics, you cannot use prostaglandin analogs. So you have to do with one of these three. As a result, you very often land up with having to do surgery in these eyes. And surgery is pretty much routine, except that you may need to use when you use trabeculectomy, you need to use antimetabolite. Antimetabolites, antimetabolites too and you also need to be careful about this entity of ciliary body shutdown. You may also need to consider removing a steroid depot if you think that is the cause for the intractable glaucoma. So I'll just share with you this gentleman, 20 year old man with intermediate uveitis. He had secondary angle closure, 360 degrees and early coronal decompensation. He came to us looking somewhat like this. He has peripheral sinicae all around. He did a trabeclectomy after releasing the sinicae superiorly. His intraocular pressure before that was 40 millimeters of mercury. We did a trap with sinicolysis pressures dropped to 15 millimeters of mercury. He was followed up for six months post trap and then he landed up with a pressure of zero. And that blood which was functioning reasonably well till then now looks like this. Anterior chamber is deep, doesn't show very much of inflammation. And this is classic ciliary body shutdown. His other eye is even worse. He's got uh, 1 by 60 vision in that eye. This eye has 636. So you started on systemic steroids, intensive topical steroids. And after three weeks of this therapy, his intraocular pressure was 12 millimeters of mercury. And now you can see that blood starting to elevate. This happened just before we came for the meeting. And we are fortunate here because what typically happens in this situation is another six weeks from now, his pressure will be 30 and we will be struggling with trying to control that. What typically happens in these eyes is you have a high IOP, you do the glaucoma surgery, you have severe hypotony because of which you land up with. When you have severe hypotony, you have no access flow through the blood and this leads to ciliary body shutdown and your blood doesn't function and within two to three weeks, your hypotony ends up in hypertony. So you have to make sure that even if it's a uveitic eye, you need to make sure that preoperatively inflammation is well controlled and postoperatively acute enough uh, uh, sort of inflammation control is done. This is the second gentleman. He's about 30 years old. I mean, he's got chronic uveitis. He's a sympathetic ophthalmia. He's had post. He's had a trabeculectomy. He's had a keratoplasty. His intraocular pressure on timolol, bromonidine, dorsolamide was 40 millimeters of mercury. Started on acetazolamide one four times a day. IOP, 24 hours later, is 2 millimeters of mercury. You stop the acetazolamide, IOP is go to 35, 40. Start it, it drops to 0 or 2. So when you reduce the dose of acetazolamide to half a tablet three times a day, his IOP is about 10 millimeters of mercury. So his ciliary body is in that narrow zone of function. And this is somebody you should not touch surgically. You touch him surgically, you are looking at a thysical eye. He, we have been following him up for more than a year now. He's on all these medications. We are monitoring his blood reports, but we are left with no other options. Very, very borderline ciliary body function. If you see somebody like this, don't touch them surgically. I, I wanted to show you a video on this, but unfortunately it's not working. It's a laser PI and uveitic eyes, which are really very, very badly inflamed. Only two pieces of advice. Immediately before the PI, start them on 15 minutes uh, every uh, every 15 minutes prednisolone eye drops and continue it at that level post PI post trabeclectomy I told you that you need to ex uh, expect early post-op hypertony and late post-op spikes so flow titration is a must and you must put in you must put in uh, I mean, this is basically just a trabeclectomy in a uveitic eye. You're doing the PI there, make sure that it's large enough, and you have to make sure that you put in releasable sutures. If you do not put in releasable sutures, after the hypotonist phase, when your blood is starting to scar down, you'll be left with no options. So in this particular patient, we actually put in two releasables, and uh, I mean, I prefer to put in releasables, which sort of where the one end of the suture is tucked under the conjunctiva here so there's no loose end to rub on the cornea and you tie the releasables down tight in order to make sure that there is no other area of leak which can potentially explain the hypotony. These eyes very often land up with a choroidal effusion too and they need to be on systemic steroids. Again, meticulous closure of the conjunctiva is very important. So I typically take two wing sutures and also a central mattress to make sure that you have no fluid leaking out from there. Again, another thing that happens sometimes in these eyes, post-op IOP doing well, 
But on day 10, you suddenly see a spike in the other eye. So don't forget, if you are suspecting a steroid response, this is what is likely to happen in the other eye. And now you are really badly stuck because you cannot start systemic acetazolamide without compromising your blood function in the right eye. So if you have somebody who has a potential steroid response, explain to them that they may require some sort of uh, glaucoma surgery in the fellow eye too. And this is another little child who, uh, I'm sorry, the quality of video is really bad. He has BSK, he has GR, uh, juvenile rheumatoid arthritis, he's had a lensectomy, he has 360 degree uh, of the angle is closed. And uh, he essentially underwent a, essentially a tube with, uh, uh, and the only difference of the tube over here is instead of putting it in the eye with a sort of borderline cornea and a borderline angle, the angle is closed. You cannot definitely put it into the anterior chamber. So your only option is to go into the past planar. So you go in about three and a half millimeters behind the limbus and using this 22 gauge needle to make the entry. Make sure that the tube is more or less where you want it to be. This is possible only if a decent anterior vitrectomy has been done. It is not possible uh, in just an FAK chi where no vitrectomy has been done. So the tube, you can use a plate with an extender to do this or you can just insert it directly into the eye. And that is tamponaded down with a single suture and covered with a flap. And the uh, one thing that you must remember in these eyes is that they always tend to have a lot of encapsulation post-operatively. So once a hypotonus phase is over in the first couple of weeks, you switch to uh, make sure that you give them an acrosuppressant for a few weeks after surgery. So uveitic glaucoma, IUP control can be like a roller coaster ride. And you must be always keep in mind borderline celiac body function before you decide to operate on the patient and make sure that you have good preoperative inflammatory control before you get into the eye. Thank you.